Oh dear me, that's all going badly She's there. She's got horribly lost in Paris. For Lady Hawk, that's a shame, She's isn't it? She's forgotten to bring her her map, her guidebook. She's she lost her boyfriend. She needs the rough guide to Paris. She does. Uh, but she's forgotten to bring it. She's upset because she's found out the exchange rate is very bad. She doesn't have nearly as uh, as much money as she thought she might have. Paris is screaming in the night, she says. Yeah. Maybe that's her baby. Uh-huh. Paris. <coughs> right. Won't sleep through the night. Just a, just a guess. I think that's almost certainly right. Hello, this is Adam Buxton. Hey, I'm Joe Cornish. And uh, this is Adam and Joe here with you on BBC Six Music. We're here until midday today. This is the live show. You're listening to the yeah. live show. This is actually happening, right, in your life. Uh, this is not the podcast. This is not pre-recorded. Obviously, if this bit is included in the podcast or you're doing Listen Again, then everything I've just said is meaningless. But right now, Saturday morning, this is actually happening. And it's going to be an amazingly exciting show. It is. We're going to have some uh, exciting Stephen updates there have been all sorts of events in the Stephen sphere this week. Stephen has just gone insane. It's I, gone crazy. I got uh, a couple of Stevens in, Did you? in public this week, yeah. We're going to be filling you in about all of that. What else have we got? We've juvenilia. Got an, yeah, more juvenilia. We have had a flood of responses from people sending in clips of themselves recording bits of audio when they were very little. Some people doing radio shows, mm. the same way that Joe did last week. We played a clip of Joe pretending to be a DJ that he'd invented called John Scott. Mm. And there was also a clip of myself doing a kind of lame breakfast show as a seven-year-old. And we've had loads of clips from people doing similar things. And also just some very funny, stroke, disturbing rambles from four- and five-year-olds that we're going to be playing later on in the program i start i stopped saying that sentence because i thought you're going to leap in there joe <laughs> no no leaping That's we're also nothing. trying to think of a good text the nation <laughs> we've got various ideas circling uh some of them are a little bit lame yeah well hopefully one of them will touch down you know what one thing we discussed was even doing like a part two from last week's public pretending text the nation because we had so many good follow-ups in didn't we but i think what we're going to do is include the the pick of those good follow-ups in retro text the nation in the podcast mm. it's getting very complicated our world now isn't it there's so much business so much business to get through also of course we'll just be talking about Rubbish. random nonsense and playing all kinds of amazing music including free choices wonderful free choices. we brought some vinyl in this yeah, week i've got some vinyl as promised yeah, I'm going to play some vinyl as well later on. Real records from the actual... You know, the thing acetate. about vinyl is when you look at the sleeves, they're almost frightening because they're so huge and colourful. Yeah. They're almost overpowering. Look at Edwin Collins on the front of... What's that uh, EP there? This is uh, Orange Juice, or as they were called, The Orange Juice. With, and he's... Uh, it's like a film it? still on the front there. And Collins, aged, what, 19, maybe something 20, like something like that, he looks otherworldly. With his long but that face, that would frighten a contemporary kid, don't you think? Definitely, they wouldn't be. A contemporary kids can't handle an image of that size. They would think it was real. They would think Collins was actually stood right in They'd front. They'd think of them. it was a, a space time portal, right? Like in the Time Bandits. Yes, exactly. They'd want to jump in and tweak his oranges. Oh, <laughs> exactly. His navel. Uh, okay, right now here's some music for you. This is Private Life by J uh, Great. Oh, I've got a great. I've got a, 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 a bit. What by who? <laughs> <laughs> this is private life by get out of your bed that's not supportive what if i someone it's suggested fun. it's just fun it's light-hearted fun <laughs> it's it? banter come on is it um i'll read out an email later on from someone who suggested that i might actually have dyslexia and if mm. that turned out to be the case then you would be a dyslexia <laughs> bully <laughs> yes <laughs> finally my life's goal achieved genuine laugh this the, is grace jones i'm gonna introduce the record the now. morning's first genuine laugh from calling uh, cornish callings callings oh <laughs> just play the music that's grace jones with private life taken from her fourth album warm leatherette released in 1980 what a year uh, this is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music. Now, last week and in previous weeks, um, my co-host Adam has had some trouble reading. Yeah, a little bit. Is that bit. fair to say? Yeah. Reading some emails. I, I mean, mean you do very well when you get into the into the body of the things, but sometimes <laughs> it's the in and outs that... Yeah. Uh, and it is tricky. It's, it's, it's a tricky skill. What do you do when you're reading them through, like, on off the computer screen? Do you go out into the loo and practice there? I do, yeah. I've been trained. Right. Heavily trained. Heavily trained. Mm. And do you read, like, in your own life? Yes, I do. Yes. So you're used to reading. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a highly skilled reader of ah. words. Okay, got you. Here's an email that I got, right, that I'll try and read out. Actually, it was a quite a long email, but I'm ignoring most mm. of it. And just going to the end bit, this is from a lady from Taiwan. That's in the Republic of China, Joe. Did you know that? And she lives in room 
uh, 220. Don't say her address. <laughs> in the Institute woman. of Plant and, and Microbiology. <laughs> You're not supposed to say her address. It's all right. She lives. This is the. She lives in there. This is her office, obviously. All right. <laughs> anyway, she's called Paula. Hi, Paula. How are you doing? And she says, "Do you think that you have dyslexia, Adam? As you seem to have some of the classic signs." Maybe you're just borderline, she puts. She's dyslexic. Well, exactly. I'm not really going to get too upset about a diagnosis of dyslexia from someone who can't even write borderline. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but what if she's right? Well, what if she is right? What's the test? How do you test for it? Well, it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, that's a proper condition, dyslexia. Yeah. Maybe we should get a doctor in. But if, but if I start getting tested for dyslexia, who knows what else they're going to find? Well, it's you too could just limit their Don't you remit. Think it's just too late for me. It's never too late, man. If you're really? seriously ill, then you should get something done about it. Dyslexia is not a serious illness. It's a, I mean, it is serious if you're suffering Yeah, but it's from that affecting condition. the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's bringing the show down. Right. I think the BBC should pay for it. Well, I th I agree with oh, you. Oh, you agree? Oh, you agree? I yeah. think you've got West Countryitis. is <laughs> what you've got. <laughs> you're the cause of my dyslexia, because I don't have it anywhere else in my life. Look, I think you should try and read most of the emails today. How about that? All right, I'll d I will try. You'd be in charge. But listen, of the email if it does reading. turn out that I do have dyslexia, which is a serious condition, mm. well, then you could get fired for bullying. Yes, do you realise that. Yes, yeah, yes. I mean, that could be an, a massive storm of con con yes controversy. controversy. It could be just what we need. Controversy, exactly. To push us into the public eye. Right. Well, so, so we need to get hold <laughs> of a doctor. Well, if you know how to test for this condition, and we don't mean in any way to trivialise it. Um, other, uh, other than in the context of Adam mm. having it, uh, let us know how we could test for it. Yeah. Uh, the text number is 64046. Now, here's a free play for you, listeners. And this is from a chap called M. Ward. We played a single of his a few weeks ago, I think, didn't we? He's got a, a little hairy beard there, and um, he's got a nice, warm, retro sound. I think I read somewhere that, I don't know if he still does this, but certainly for a while, he only used to record on old analogue equipment. What's his name? M. Ward. Ah. Oh. And he refused to use any digital recording devices right. whatsoever. That was a point of principle That's with That's cool. He's cool. If he saw any, yep. like, computers or Back Pro off. Tools, he would just calm down. start getting very angry and just you know go back into his room with his tape recorder and go there and record there instead mm. what do you think of that mm, i'm scared by it he's a hard liner yeah which is strange because when you listen to his music it's really very mellow so is this recorded in that way i think it probably is this Have is called shangri-la and this is from his new album which is called hold time talking of bullying which we were just before that lovely record it was lovely that was M. Ward, by the way, with Shangri-La. So natural and analogy. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I loathe anything digital. As soon as I can whiff a little bit of one or zero on anything, it gets me furious. But we were talking about uh, bu bullying, weren't we? Yeah. You specifically yeah, bullying me. bullying you. Um, we had an email in from somebody called Dan, referring to a conversation we had last week about the Empire of the Sun, or Empire of the Sun, the exciting oh, yes. band. yes, yes. And we were talking about their imagery and stuff. Yeah. And Dan says, uh, Hello, just listening to your show, heard you talking about Empire of the Sun. I'm friends with the frontman, Luke Steele, oh. and he was far from hassled about his indiv individuality when he was younger. I know the banter between the English and the Aussies always revolves around the English thinking of us as brutish and the Aussies of you as wet rags. Is that true? That's the national stereotypes, yeah. And playing up to these stereotypes is all very entertaining. However, I thought Six Music was above the stereotyping and more about the music. What's his name, this chap? Dan. Come on, Dan, grow up! <laughs> Obviously, you are wrong. We're not above that kind of thing <laughs> at all. No, uh, you're right. You're right, Dan. We shouldn't pander to lazy stereotypes. What did we say exactly? Well, no, all I said was that I was surprised given how extremely flamboyant and ridiculous looking he is, right? Mm. That he was... Uh, I, I speculated that he must have had a hard time growing up with that level of ludicrous flamboyance in somewhere like... Uh, australia right which is generally thought to be and i did say at the time i said this is a lazy generalization but you could say 
that comparatively Australia would be a harder place than most to grow up looking like that. He was far from hassled about his individuality when he was younger, says Dan. In fact, which means he was cock of the walk. That's right. Do you think he came into school wearing his? G'day, Luke. You're looking stripe. absolutely ridiculous this morning. I love it. I lo absolutely love it. Now, I love class, what you've done with your hair this morning. Sprayed half of it pink and the other half green. Usually, we discourage pupils from coming in dressed in anything other than school uniform. But the way Luke's dressed this morning, I mean, <laughs> I mean, struth. Struth. Luke, you've elected not <laughs> to wear pants this that, morning. That stripe across your eyes is terrific. Yes. The cockatoos nesting in your armpit hair are provocative. And you've painted up your buttocks there. The size of those shoes, the right one's a metre wide, the left one's <laughs> tiny. Absolutely tiny. I don't know how you squeeze your foot in it, mate. And you appear to have taken a lady's bra and used it as shoes. And the way you've still uh, got your umbilical cord attached <laughs> and you've tied a shoebox with glitter on it onto that that's really pushing it over the edge well done mate well done mate in fact i think the whole class should stand up and salute luke for the way that he's come into school yeah. this morning but he's luke, an example to us all in future don't bring the tiger mate it's it's just mauled uh tom tommy <laughs> the, tom tommy <laughs> the tigers are dangerous yeah not the tiger you've mate. gone too far with the tiger yeah, and, and can you get the spaceships to hover a little higher they're yes. just, uh, they're grazing the heads of some of the younger pupils. And also, Luke, you're not a robot from the future, just to tell you. But everything else is great and good on you. What a brilliantly accurate uh, depiction of the Australian accent. What was his name there who sent the email again? Dan. Dan. There you go. You happy now, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, That'll solve those issues. I think it's time for a trail, isn't it, Ben? Here we go. Oh, Ben, where's the trail? There you go. That's for any listener who's at sea or is a sailor. <laughs> Who or, was that? Or a pirate. Captain Pugwash. Was that the... What was that? That the was the Wonder Stuff. stuff. There yeah. you go. Is, that's not new Wonder Stuff, is it? That's old No, Wonder it's from stuff. 92. They haven't reformed. I mean, they've Welcome reformed the for gigs, seats. haven't they? But I don't know if they're producing new, new actual music. So listen, Joe, last week, right, on uh, Friday when I came to London before our show, I was cycling down in South London and crossing a busy junction hmm. when i saw right in the middle a wallet a big fat wallet Ooh. on the road so i leapt off my bike as soon as there was a lull in the traffic I had to do it quickly because it was a really busy junction down there near the oval and i scooped up the wallet and uh immediately pulled over onto the side of the road by a pub and had uh, a drink and i was there for about a, a to celebrate day. the wallet no i didn't have a drink i just pulled over and i inspected the contents of the wallet First thing that went through my mind, what do you think the first thing that went through my mind was? It depends how much cash was in the wallet. <coughs> well, exactly. I was curious to see if there was any cash in the wallet, right? Because it had clearly just fallen out of either a cyclist's bag or, I don't know, maybe someone... So you mean no one h had time to get there before you? Exactly. I was the first <laughs> person on the scene. <laughs> you think somebody might pick up the wallet, take out the cash and pop it down again? Yeah, yeah. A yobbo, uh, you know, like yeah. a, or a thief or whatever. Mm. If they'd nicked it, they might have taken the, w the money out and, and just lobbed the wallet out the window. That's what mm. the thieves do sometimes. That's true, that's true. And uh, I, so I checked for, for cash, and it flashed across my brainium in just a second, right? A split second even, not, not as long as a second. Like, if there's any cash in here, I might just nick it and then get rid of the wallet, right? I'm admitting that because I believe that most people would, would entertain that thought for a, a microsecond and then discard it, as I did almost immediately i mean it came back again a couple of times but i i got rid of it each time mm. actually it was moot because there was no money in the wallet so what i then did what was... about card fraud well exactly <laughs> <laughs> i can't help noticing that sometimes despite the world of chip and pin and super security sometimes yeah. you go into a shop there's absolutely no chipping and pinning it's the telephone ordering though right, isn't it exactly you can buy anything on the telephone <laughs> with a card right all they yeah. do is flip it over and ask you for the security code on the back that's right what kind of security is that it's a joke you can go telephone shopping mad you can go telephone shopping mad for about catalog shopping at least a day i would say before the before the bank get wise this is this is is this irresponsible? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but we're talking hypothetically. hypothetically yeah. Were you a criminal or somebody with no morals? Right, that's what you would do. And I'm talking from the perspective of a victim. Yeah, I'm saying that were someone to steal my wallet, yes, you say I'm talking from the perspective of, of a the perpetrator. Yeah. yeah, yeah, thinking, ooh, <laughs> um, no, 
Well, instead, what I did was I went through. What sort of a criminal is that who thinks, oh, Oh. Mm, little bit of fraud? Oh, it's not very (laughs) Tarantino-esque. That's what they really like, though. (laughs) Tarantino (laughs) fails to grasp. Oh, little doggy. Oh, you go to bark. (laughs) Where you go to bite? (laughs) Woo! You're you're barking. (laughs) Woo! 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 Uh, cut your ear off. I might have to a good idea. I might have to cut your nails off. <laughs> I might have to cut your hair. Do, do your nail. What kind of c- grotesque caricature is this now? Anyway, yeah. listen. What I did with the wallet was I went through the contents, right? Mm. And uh, I got the guys, you know, trying to find some phone number or other. So I, I, I found his gym membership card. Or what I assumed was like, it was a, a card from some gym, and I, I phoned up the gym. It's probably a gym membership card. <coughs> you reckon? Yeah. Yeah. So I phoned up the gym, and uh, I, I said the name of the guy of the wallet that I had found. <laughs> <laughs> well, the dyslexia is really <laughs> kicking in. <laughs> Do you was know what? I was pausing because gym. I was I was anticipating the end of this story, and I was anticipating I up the, the scorn bucket that his was going to come gym. from Corn Bucket. <laughs> corn bucket. <laughs> no, with I'm his enjoying it. Bucket. It's an exciting story. Yeah, well, just don't talk about dyslexia in the middle of the exciting sorry, story. Sorry. Then, I mean, you've derailed my printer story on a number of occasions. I know someone text uh, emailed in about that. Yeah, didn't they? don't you dare well, derail you finish the... this one. Finish this one. Come on, push. I'm worried now because it doesn't just have a push. proper <laughs> ending. Well, you were gonna. The words were going to continue, weren't they? So what I did was I phoned up the guy, the, the yeah. gym, right, yeah. and spoke to quite a clueless-sounding guy there. It, uh, can you bring the wallet in? Oh, uh, <laughs> can, can you drop it off? No, because I'm in South London and the gym, your gym is in Norwood. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, what, um, what, why are you calling? Well, because I was hoping you could get in touch with this member and then, um, tell him that I found his wallet and give him a call thinking that they would have his detail oh so you want me you uh so i would call him and you would drop off the wallet so no it took a while to establish what i wanted but eventually the guy said he was dyslexic too <laughs> you're, you're gonna be in trouble man. i'm gonna be in trouble <clears throat> and uh sure enough it worked though the guy sorted it out and a few minutes later i got a call from this chap he said oh you found my wallet i'm so grateful thank you he cycled around to my house he wasn't too far in south london and i just i got such a huge amount of pleasure from like not making a big deal out of it right mm. i just handed it over just opened the door yeah hi yeah i'm the i'm the wallet finding guy I haven't stolen anything from your wallet might, might like to have a look absolutely nothing missing i'm just going to hand it over i'm not going to make did it... he know you'd replace the entire contents with duplicates <laughs> <laughs> yeah little plastic cards that i just scrawled on just handed it over it was a wonderful feeling i felt what like a fantastic feeling I felt like jesus it was wonderful you know and I, I and i i really made a meal out of not making a meal out of it do you know what i mean yeah in my own head yeah i was like a saint that's a good story man we should talk <laughs> further but we gotta go to the news <laughs> oh that oh stop what? shut up this music's still playing that's milk milk with love get out of my way is that milk with sean penn no the, uh, no they've got an e on the end as you say that was a record that went out to all dogs or anyone who likes ultrasonic whistles and it's got a very sexy cover ben our producers put a little capture of it there can you see that adam on page three of your list it's got a couple of um gender Oof. ambiguous people well men they're called well one of them could be a lady, lady oh i see i see yeah it's a bit like that was it pulp who did a similar Oh, no, it was... Well, who was the band that did the similar androgynous kiss in placebo? the 90s? Maybe it was Placebo, was it? I can't remember. No, it was... What's his I name? I mean, it's an old thing. Everyone does it, the androgynous kiss. But this time there's a bit of tongue. Right. That's what... Or, or is that a lip? No one... I can't quite tell what's going on, but It might be a sweet. It's provocative and, and sexy. Is it one of those sweet, shrimpy sweets? What, like a, a, a powdered shrimpy shrimp? Thing. Yeah. Like a marshmallow Is that what shrimp. Is they call those shrimps? Are they just called shrimps? Yeah, they're called shrimps. <laughs> yeah. No, I, no, it isn't. I do, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be. <laughs> I think that would make it less cool. <laughs> yeah. Two androgynous people <laughs> passing a shrimp. <laughs> no, I think it'd make it more cool. <laughs> anyway, that was Milke. Were you happy about Sean Penn uh, winning for Milke? I was, yes, but I thought his... This was at the Oscars, obviously, yeah. which I, I didn't watch. I only watched the highlights, but did you watch it? My... You know what? I can't figure out how to get my Skybox to stop switching itself off automatically. Really? You've got the sleep button yeah, or something. Yeah, so I much. only taped an hour of it, and then it switched off. Or, or rather, I only taped an hour of Fern Cotton's... Uh, I had to stop myself doing some swearing in the middle of uh, saying her name there. Coverage of the red carpet right. stuff. 
Why does she have to cover everything, Fern Cotton? Because she's very peppy. I know, but is there no one else? I mean, she's wonderful and talented and beautiful, but it, there must be other people. Like you. Like me. And me. <laughs> on the red carpet. <laughs> but no, so I didn't really see, uh, all I heard was, um, stuff and, uh, on the radio thereafter, bits of speeches, Kate Winslet's, um, mm. so-called restrained speech. Well, that's the thing, uh, seeing as you ask, what's his face? Sean Penn, he did a very self-aggrandizing speech. Self-effacing, surely. Mm, it was, but it was in this sort of weird cosmic, uh, language, as if it was a bit of Marlon Brando dialogue from Superman 1. Uh-huh. Um, Mickey Rock has risen again. S phrases like that, you know, as if the, as if this is an event that God's hold oh, I didn't for, for hear mortals. That bit. Ah. Whereas all the British speeches were very self-effacing. Yeah. It was Danny Boyle jumping up and down like Tigger, mm -hmm. and Winslet talking about shampoo bottles, yeah. kind of letting the air out of the whole thing. Whereas Milk was still in old uh, Milk. Um, what's his name? Penn. Sean Penn was still in old school Oscar mode. I prefer that though. You know the whole thing grandiosity of, yeah I, the, the whole thing of winslet and her shampoo bottle rings totally hollow to me anyway I, in a way that it doesn't with danny boyle so much you know because it's, it's empty yeah the shampoo bottle yeah she's used it all yeah yeah fair enough uh not that i begrudge winslet her wins she's a wonderful talented actress uh i can't wait to see revolutionary road it's top of my list of must see <laughs> <laughs> is it yes it's been out for weeks i love domestic drama any I kind of domestic go and see it, but my lady friend says it's too depressing oh really i yeah. know apparently it's not a good date movie no it convinces you it's that marriage about, is yeah. a point marriage and children are misery hollow institution yeah i know it's 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 a tough one in that respect but maybe i'll just go on my own yeah <laughs> but i was glad that Penn won for milk because he is very very brilliant in that film even though, as Rupert Everett says, isn't it weird that only a straight man can play, like, uh, one of the most famous gay men in history mm. and get a, a big prize for it? Why, you think if it was a gay guy playing him, he wouldn't have won? Yeah, possibly not. Or really? no, he wouldn't have got cast in the first place. In really? That. Yeah. That's, it's still the same thing, you know? Because all... the, the public can only handle pretend kisses. Exactly, yeah. They can only handle uh, a pretend gay. Uh, uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, the whole film's about homophobia and, and everything like that, and you still think, well, homophobia is still a very big part of the movie industry. Yeah. In it's a just... lot of ways. Yeah, definitely. Don't you reckon? Is that controversial? I I'm not sure it is, <laughs> but it may maybe, maybe it's right in a way, yeah. Like, in terms of how the outside world perceives it, yeah, this is getting a bit yeah. serious. Yeah, yeah. Listen to Rupert Everett's, um, or read U Rupert Everett's biography, Red Carpets and Other something he talks about it at the end okay it's, it's interesting anyway uh what was i saying oh yeah i was gonna say that i was sad that mickey rock didn't win I was yeah that's win. sad isn't it but he's won lots of things he's won his he's globe. had a great a great year but you think once you've won the globe you're in a shoe in for the oscars it's cruel to be robbed of the oscar listen to you you're talking like fern cotton now <laughs> in a second we're going to have a go at launching text the nation listeners but let's have a bit of music first are we going to have some jimmy hendrix yeah. yeah this is a a guitar player from the olden days who used to set fire to things. Uh, this is called Purple Haze. Jimi Hendrix there with Purple Haze. This is Adam and Joe on he BBC says, Six Music. He says, excuse me while I kiss this guy. Did, does he say that? <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> excuse me while I kiss this guy. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like that's what he says. <laughs> You're obsessed with kissing guys. Listen, if what I, if my comments about the homophobia rampant in the Hollywood film industry are removed from this week's podcast, then I quit! Okay? You're really taking a stand. I am taking a st t The time is now for me to stand up and be counted. Who do you think should have played Milk in Milk if it wasn't Sean Penn? Um, Rupert Everett. <laughs> Do you think that would have been good? Yes, he would have done a great job. He's a great actor. He's a great actor. He's more flamboyant. It's true. I mean, he physically he's ungainly, maybe, and less suited to the role than Penn was. Mm. He's very tall. He's not ungainly, but you know what I mean. Like Mil I don't think Milk was. Yeah, Milk wasn't that tall. But they could have. Short they could shorten him with they CGI. Could exactly. They could. They could squash <laughs> like him in down. Forrest Gump. <laughs> He'd be on his knees with slippers on his knees, and then blue over here, the bottom of his legs. <laughs> blue screen legs. Exactly. Yeah, they uh, photoshopped my legs out. <laughs> <laughs> he could easily do it. He could do. He could do the accent. He could do any of that stuff. <laughs> you know, and it makes me absolutely sick that they just had to go to Sean Penn. Mm. As great an actor as he is. Mm. What are we going to... We should launch Text the Nation, right? Yes, we should. Should we have the jingle jungle, Ben? Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. 
so listeners i was looking through my vinyl this week to try and find something to play i'll be playing something off vinyl a bit later but i came across uh a kind of a valuable collectible Oof. that when i first acquired it i thought was going to be like a sort of family heirloom right what was this beatles signed beatles record no this is a signed copy of the lexicon of love <gasps> by abc that is a classic album yes yeah, signed by all of the bands no way. martin tristran oh, herbert martin. and tony wow uh what what are their names yeah martin tristan herbert and tony yeah they all signed it in silver yeah and i bought it in woolworths the late great Wool where did you get it signed uh it was just on the shelf they'd been in for a signing they'd, ah. they'd over signed right and there were some leftover ones. Hard but to believe. I remember how excited I was at the time. I thought this was like finding, you know, the Golden Idol in Raiders or something. Or as if Nemo. I, finding Nemo, exactly. As if I'd sort of stumbled upon the world's most precious thing. But um, 25 years later, mm. looking on eBay, twenty nine ninety nine for a signed vinyl copy. Not of, bad. Not bad, you think? I would think, I would, you know, I would have thought about 15 quid for a really? signed copy. Really? I was expecting triple figures. So our question Triple for you in uh, Text the Nation this week, listeners, is what's the most valueless uh, bit of pop culture collectible? Does that make sense? Yeah. What's the most valuable, valueless, pathetic pop culture collectible you've got? Yeah. Like a thing that you thought was really precious maybe 10, 15 years ago, or maybe even recently that, you know, you've stopped your partner from clearing out of the house. Maybe One you've packed it in bubble wrap in the loft. But you fear now that it's absolutely pathetic and worthless. I mean, I've got crates of that stuff. Really? L literally crates. About about five or six crates of stuff that I cannot throw away because I think, oh, no. Can't throw away the uh, the very first Lord of the Rings plastic cup from the... You've got one of those? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I got a big. What uh, sort of a cup? Well, it's like a big gulp thing. Oh, I've you know? got a Fifth Element big gulp, and it's and it's got uh, lenticular on it. <gasps> so when you turn it round, wow. Frodo's doing things. I mean, it's a. I thought. How much do you think that's worth? Well, absolutely nothing. I would say thirty p, fifty p, maybe. Of, I'm going to find <laughs> out now. <laughs> All I've done. The only. The, the only. Th the only thing I do with it now, and I, I wince to think of it now, is that at some point my wife used it uh, to put some paint in. She was doing some painting. Right. She put a bit of paint in there. Here they are. Uh, three Lord of the Rings, Return of the King holograph cups. Are yours Return of the King? uh well, that, that's the last film oh maybe it is return of the king yeah how much 3.99 for three that's more than i thought really 3.99 for three 3.99 for three that's on still eBay. more than i thought <laughs> <laughs> but i've got, yeah i've still got those even though they're covered in paint now and everything and totally messed up they wouldn't even be worth 3.99 for three the text number is 64046 listeners text us in the most worthless pathetic item of collectibles that mm. you possess the other thing this is are we extending this to hoarding in general or not really? I mean, we've talked before about things that you can't throw away, like my collection of Mojo magazines and stuff right. like that. Right. Which I don't, I, I still don't understand well, why. Well, some of those have collectible. I mean, the word collectible is used very, very loosely, isn't it? Yeah. It's as if all you have to do is write it on something and then that object becomes collectible. Yeah. You could write it on um, some litter <laughs> or a wall or a tramp's head or something. And then if you put a signature on it as well. Right then it becomes really but magazines sometimes have collectible issues right empire yes. always do like for empire's birthday was it they had a hundred different covers so presumably somebody out there's collected all a hundred and is expecting them to increase in value Mo did mojo ever do that sometimes yep yep they had the beatles covers like haven't they got some who covers at the moment two who covers one of pete townsend and one of like the old um, sellout Dutchie. covers oh right i think they've got collectible covers at the moment are they worth anything well, surely not at the moment they're probably worth about 450 or whatever right, the, whatever the cover price is yeah but no i mean i can't believe that they would be worth anything even in a hundred years time really mm. they would be worth marginally more than the cover price i'm, I'm very happy to be corrected if that's not the case but, but the stories we'd like i suppose uh, uh, it's a sort of ratio of how coveted they are to how worthless they are yeah do you know what i mean the lengths you go to protect them to stop people throwing them out to take care of them not to have them damaged to pack them away and then as time passes you realize that you've completely wasted yeah your time because i did find a load of stuff the other day that i've kept with me not exactly collections of stuff but uh i had loads of packets of photographs like old school photographs that i'd taken to the printers and got back you know and and kept them all religiously wouldn't throw any away you know like now with digital photography when you're skimming through them right mm. 
and organizing them if, if you're that organized then you get rid of all the blurry ones right and the ones that are absolutely rubbish you just trash them but you didn't do that really with with old school photographs you'd keep every single one even if it was a bit blurry i'm not sure photographs count do they not well they're not really acquired are they yeah but it's things that no, you find difficult to no that's a different topic no. isn't it yeah it's good though <laughs> <laughs> listen here's some uh, the, te the tech number is 64046 here's some vinyl we said last week we we're gonna we were gonna bring some vinyl in and play some vinyl but um what's happened is i bought it in this morning and then our producer ben said we couldn't actually play it spin it live in the studio we had to sort of burn it off a turntable onto digital are you upset that i've told them that well it comes to the same thing it's a completely pointless it, thing to admit yeah do you think well it's obviously you're going to be broadcasting it digitally anyway because that's the way that this radio station yeah, is broadcast true. i wanted to hear the needle go on the vinyl and, right. the, and the popping and stuff you wanted to to, to put the needle on yourself is what yeah. you wanted and yeah and fool around yeah with it. and but, maybe tickle the stylus a bit yeah maybe that would have been rubbish anyway but see if you can hear any sonic difference in the quality of this recording that's come off vinyl this is orange juice from their uh, EP The Orange Juice, or was it an album, The Orange Juice? This is called I Guess I'm Just a Little Too Sensitive. You can definitely hear that it's fine. Do you think? Yeah, because you can hear the, the, the treble on the hi-hat there is a little frayed. Do you know what I mean? Oh, the, the bass is supposed to be a Fuzzy. bit more sort of warm and deep on vinyl, yeah. isn't it? Because digital recordings tend to sort of crispify everything. Mm. A bit, they're, they're quite trebly, aren't they? We're using they? all the technical terms. Crispify. Crispify, <laughs> frayed. But you know Fuzzy. when you when you get a low quality uh, digital recording mm -hmm. and it sounds as if you know it's being channeled by aliens. All the compression is horrid, yeah. Yeah, and there's weird weird tones and notes and sort of a sort of tinny whistly sound to everything. Yeah, it doesn't have that, does it? No, it does not have no. that. No, it is much more warm and yeah. analog. I tell you, who'd like that? Who? Your bloke that likes analog things. M Ward. Yeah, he'd love that. He would absolutely love That's that. That's the only track he'd like on today's show. Yeah. He'd be furious about the rest. He'd be absolutely livid. <laughs> <What>? Livid? <laughs> Let's not hear how that would sound. Why did you make that face then? Because like I thought you were going to go livid. You wanted but, me to go livid? Yeah, uh, uh, well, I'm enjoying, like, getting you excited, then stopping it. Winding me down again? <laughs> yeah. Now it would be insane for me to go livid. <laughs> Why were you doing that? Are you because of the expression on your face. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a little, a little a geezer little that's about to blow his puppet top. puppet man. <laughs> I'm not your bouncy puppet man with dyslexia. Why have you come in this morning thinking, I'm going to treat Adam like a bouncy puppet man. I'm going to accuse him fun. of having dyslexia. I'm going to tease him. I'm going to take him to the brink. coming in in the morning. I'm going to take him to the brink of blowing his top. <laughs> and then I'm going to pull him right down it's again. It's so easy, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Why fun. do you think it's easy? It's easy you know what? I, I, wish, I wish everybody could come in and have the fun that I have. <laughs> it's easy because I want to make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear let's have some uh, music uh, now let's have a trail oh a trail is yeah. it trail for merchants merchants back it's not my favorite blur track did you watch uh damon and what's his name mr cox uh playing together for the first time in oh, ages no, at didn't. the nme shockwave awards <laughs> no i missed the shockwave awards <laughs> so did i i had to go to bed because it was about midnight last yeah. night i had to be up early to what were you doing watching here? it even thinking that there might be some bad behavior i turned on and I, I i saw charlie brooker give an award to the boosh oh and that was amusing and i remembered our time at the nme awards <laughs> oh yes when was that it's burned 10 into years my mind. ago or something around yeah and it was not a happy experience for either of us what no. we were we were accepting an award on behalf of Travis or something that's peculiar. right yeah but it was so rowdy it was unpleasant somebody kicked over the podium uh gruff reese gruff was reese. it gruff reese yeah. it was scary it was like one of those school assemblies where it gets out of control and the teachers can't control Mogwai anything why were screaming abuse people, at people were swearing it wasn't very fun was it no but times have changed <laughs> and things have become more conservative and it was a very a bit like the brits it was a very it seemed a very problem free well and sort of respectful mm. enemy awards mm -hmm. uh anyway that's why i was watching and how how were all barn and um, didn't see them you didn't no <laughs> i'm sorry i brought it up well, so am I. I'm, listen, I'm sorry that I, I, I said that it wasn't my favourite Blur song. It's not a constructive thing to say after you've just listened to a piece of music. No. You know what I mean? If the DJ ostensibly is playing the music and then he says, yeah, I didn't really like that yeah, one. Yeah, why would we play it if you don't even like it? Well, it was on the playlist, but I mean, I love Blur, right? And it, I do like that song, but it's not my favourite. Plus, it has that very slow... Which is deliberately designed to fox DJs, right? Presumably, that's part of it. At the, the beginning. Yeah. Mm. 
and it just creates a a, a, a gap in the um, soundscape of the show where where people think oh they've messed up and actually no they haven't <laughs> it's just the blur and their sonical games and I hate that. So All right, much hate today. <laughs> just getting it out of my system. It's nice. This program for listen. I went to see Bolt. <laughs> right, I'm changing yes. the subject. <laughs> you did it in the middle of a sentence. Yeah. I like that. I <laughs> abandoned it. I absolutely jumped ship. I went to see Bolt. Uh, it's about a dog, and it was it's in, in 3D. It's in 3D. I went to see the 3D version. When you go and see these films, you have a choice of seeing the normal 2D version, or you can go to a 3D <clears throat> yeah. screening. It's in Real D, in fact. Is it? There are two rival 3D systems: oh. Real D and Dolby. Right. Yeah. I met the guy that runs Real D when I was in America. He was very nice. Was he? His I name bet was Josh. I bet he's nice. He invited me to come over and uh, look at some 3D things. Yeah. Why don't they call it Reality? Because they're not as clever as you. Yeah, that's the reason, isn't reality. it? Reality. Yeah. I mean, real D. I mean, they're just missing a trick, mm. not calling mm. it reality. You're right. I would think. Yeah. Well, that's another conversation, Why isn't it? Why am I not more famous and rich? <laughs> I just can't understand it. So it is another conversation. I went to see it in 3D or real D or whatever mm. you want to call it. And I saw about four or five trails for forthcoming CG-based attractions in a similar vein. All in 3D. The Monsters vs. Aliens. Monsters vs. Aliens mm. was in there. Uh, Coraline. Coraline, yeah, that looked mm -hmm. really good. About a little girl who finds mm. a portal in her house to a magical land where everything's slightly different. By the guy who did Nightmare Before Christmas. It's a Neil Gaiman book, yeah. Henry Selick. Right, yeah. Looks great. Done it. Anyway, all these things were in 3D. And it was pretty gobsmacking. The 3D is yeah. amazing now, yeah. right? And you've got these little uh, glasses that look... They're slightly larger Wayfarer or Ray-Ban Yeah, they're not red glasses. and blue anymore. No. They're just like sunglasses. They're it looks polarized. Like, exactly. It, it looks like everyone is um, wearing Blues Brothers-style mm. shades in there, and they're just slightly large. It doesn't look too ludicrous. Mm. Everything about seeing a 3D film has been sort of fixed. And the 3D itself is amazing. The most amazing thing is the company logos that come at you, right? Yes. For, for all the actual makers of the 3D and stuff. To the extent that they were even gasps in really? the auditorium a couple of times, wow. right? Appreciative gasps and whoops of joy at a couple of the 3D bits before the film started. Then Bolt starts, right? Bolt's a good, fun film. Children really enjoyed it. Actually, that's not entirely true. My son, Frank didn't enjoy it so much because you know the premise of bolt yeah i hear that bolt's not that sympathetic himself is he he's an arrogant dog he's quite an arrogant he thinks dog. he's got superpowers well it's uh, the film is about a dog who genuinely believes that he is a super dog <clears throat> it's a bit truman showy isn't it right and he discovers throughout the course of the film that actually that's not the case he's just a normal dog who was part of a tv show mm. where he'd been uh, conditioned to believe that it was actually real and my son was very disappointed when that happened because what's fun about that he wants to see a film about a dog with real powers. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, if you're a seven-year-old, um, being told that actually, in reality, you don't have superpowers is not a fun thing to be told. Anyway, so he was a bit disappointed about that. But no one could quibble with the quality of the actual 3D. No quality quibble. No quality quibbles there. Oh, no. It actually seemed real and happening I was in there. Yes. For about ten minutes. Mm. And then my brain adjusted, and I mm. completely forgot that I was watching a 3D film. And... My brain did what a brain always does when you go and see a 2D film. It took you into the film and made you forget that actually it wasn't happening. Uh, I, it allowed you, it, I'm not explaining this well, but if you go and see a 2D film, right? Yeah. Then after a while, if you're sufficiently absorbed and enjoying the film, you, you forget about the fact that it's 2D. You're in there. Yeah. And the same thing happens in reverse when you see a 3D film, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, like, why are they plunging all this money and excitement into a technology that actually is... I know, the problem... Cancels itself The problem out. is I know too much about this. Right. And it's not very entertaining. Yeah. And it'll go on for ages. But why I is mean, it I really do know too much about the, the, the <laughs> Z-axis. Yeah. Axis, rather. But why, why, do you, why do they think people need to see films in 3D when well, the brain... Well, Josh, the head of Real D, dis I asked him exactly this. I said, yeah. does it wear off? And he said, no, it doesn't wear off, because the main application for this technology is military simulators, where they have to sit and or, or they have to sit and watch it all day. Yeah. So if it wore off, then our boys in the military, yeah, and yeah. girls, would uh, be endangered. But, it, but, but for a so cinema audience... So he claims audience, that it doesn't wear off. It does wear off. Oh, it doesn't wear off. You're still... If you remind yourself consciously... Oh, but you just forget about the effect. Yes. Yeah. And you, you're no longer amazed yeah, by it. You become more absorbed. You've, ah, but that's the thing. Do you? I just don't know if you do. 
I just think you watch it and after a while, after you're used to it, your brain adjusts and that whole part of the experience is eliminated and you're just watching another film. Maybe. And the fact that it's projected in 3D is completely meaningless. Yeah. And actually, if it was suddenly in 2D, you would sort of think for a second, oh, it stopped being 3D. <laughs> but again, you would get used to it in five minutes mm -hmm. and it would just be a normal I don't know, film. I can't answer this. I want you to answer it! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop shouting now. But it's it's interesting. Though, it is interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, let's just have a little think about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, <laughs> some music. Uh, should we have some music? Here's Doves. We're going to come back to that. Come back to it in 20 years' time, right? <laughs> when the industry has woken up to the fact that they are wasting their time! That's Doves with Kingdom of Rust. This is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music. It's time to catch up with some Text the Nation submissions. Let's have the jingle. Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. And Text the Nation this week is all about the most pathetic collectible thing you've ever bought. Something that claims it's going to be valuable and it's collectible and, oh, mustn't be thrown away or in any way damaged, that years later is clearly worthless and a complete waste of time. I still have my train spotting VHS collectible set with free glasses. Oh, uh, free glasses? Oh, free shot glasses. No, 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 no. Uh, like shades with orange oh glass in them yeah cool uh round spectacles with orange glass i mean no not cool and also a rizzler holder and basically it was a, a really, drugs kit yeah it was like a bit of lame drugs paraphernalia mm. uh along with the copy of the film and i think the script <laughs> as well <laughs> really yeah i mean obviously i didn't buy it for the film it's I, collectible, I, I wanted the glasses and the and the yeah. uh, rizzler holder and the lighter yeah. With train spotting right across, across the, the syringe. How much do you think that would be worth? Um, I don't know. It's easy to find out these days on eBay. Yeah. I could find out. <laughs> Make you, a little note of it. Now, can you do it now? I think it would be fun radio. Do you think? The tip tapping on the keys. Let's have some text from people then. Here is one from John in Bristol. He says, Hi, guys. In 1997, I spent a whopping £20 on a 12-inch copy of the Manic Street Preacher's debut single, apparently signed by the whole band from a record shop in Norwich. Mm. That's where you live. <laughs> yeah, you always yeah. say that. Oh, look, Norwich. It's exciting. Adam. Yes. Even though the shop owner was <laughs> arrested for forging autographs the following month, <laughs> all it... And it was all signed in an unconvincing crap borrower. Did you listen to that last bit? Yes, I did, yeah. Arrested for forging autographs. He still can't throw it away. It lives in his dad's loft. So that's a forged, <laughs> signed Manic Street Preacher's debut single. That's insanity. Wow, that's quite a good idea for raising money, isn't it? Forging stuff. Yeah. No, it's not a good idea. Uh, mm, but, Rip you know, laws are going to have to be pushed a bit in the recession, aren't <laughs> they? <laughs> That's what I was saying. What court. does that mean? So, Mr Cornish, <laughs> would you like to make a statement? <laughs> yeah. Mm, you know, a little bit grey area. Yeah, but what is Isn't forgery? That? Well, Mr Cornish, forgery is when you deliberately <laughs> mislead people into thinking that something is signed by Richie Manick and actually Maybe it's that's just a you. better text the nation. I had an idea for raising money. Oh, I won't go into that, actually. It's a different taxonation. <laughs> criminal. <laughs> what criminal behaviour? Well, it could be a good taxonation. Things that are just on the edge of a little legality. Bit yeah. Or forging a signature of someone and selling an album. Yeah, but can you prove it? Yes, What if the Mannix were drunk that day? <laughs> what if they were hung over and their hands were a bit shaky? Can the Mannix prove that it's not their signature? Graphologists are employed to do exactly they're that. They're fallible. <laughs> no, they're not. Aren't they? Yeah. Okay. You win. Case <laughs> closed. Here's another one from Pierre in mm. Birmingham. Hello, Adam and Joe. Mm. Mm. I went to great lengths of sneakiness and subterfuge to swipe a towel from off the stage at a polyphonic spree gig. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad start Sweaty already. Towel. There's about 40 of them. They're just random people turn up for that band. <laughs> uh, he continues, I've kept it safe in my room for about eight years, convinced it's a piece of rock history, when in reality it's just a plain white towel like any other. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> well, that's a different debate. There is though, a lead it? guy in the polyphonic spree, isn't there? Yes. But What's they're a collective. Name? Happy, Johnny Happy Johnny face. Happy Johnny Face. Yeah. Uh, they are a collective, though. They're like they? a commune, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, so that's... Now, there are loads, as you say, and you would imagine that the the value, the provenance of uh, a sweaty towel mm. would be hard to establish and also hard to care about. Well, Pierre in Birmingham <laughs> cared about it. Well done, Pierre. <laughs> Keep hold of it. Don't let it go. Uh, Stephen Sheffield says, We have a prized white towel from an NERD gig, which my wife fought 
tooth and nail for at the gig wow you know how frenzied people get at gigs when they throw something out absolutely people go mad even if it's just some free promotional single it suddenly whilst flying through the air uh, attains an enormous worth doesn't it you know what it always makes me sad whenever i see it happening whenever like a guitarist out there because sometimes they make very over the top gestures yeah and maybe they'll even lob why does a it whole... make you sad because of the behavior of the audience a Pe- kind of prehistoric yeah, no it makes me sad because i always think i wouldn't get it <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't get it they'd shove me out of the way I so would... you want to be in there scrabbling for it no i don't i hate scrabbling it makes me anxious you just want to be given it yes instead of it being thrown out to please can else. i have it please can i have it i was going to throw this out it. but i'm going to give this to adam that's my pharrell impression <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks pharrell um what's the end of that did no i, I hate that scrabbling one? it's awful did i finish that one yeah people his wife fought for fought for the towel tooth and nail at the gig it turned out to be a brand new ikea towel <laughs> worthless <laughs> so it hadn't even worthless. been wiped on pharrell's because head. here's the thing as an addendum to my comments there right mm. i always imagine the, the the feeling of disappointment of the person right next to it because sometimes the item lands in one person's hand yeah. and then someone else in the crowd will Assaults snatch them. it off them. yeah and how how are you going to be happy for the rest of that gig if someone's just nabbed the drumsticks off you now i've remembered the idea in. for text the nation right uh but we can do it next week okay i'll tell you about it uh it was for um it was for a, a, a manifesto for behavior at gigs okay because i saw the fleet foxes yes uh, and there was some poor behavior there we're going to talk about that later on though yeah right? we'll talk about that later okay. uh, another one then this is one from eddie and lester i have a life-size adamant cardboard cutout stuck in the loft that my wife thinks is priceless <laughs> frankly it gives me the willies <laughs> <laughs> i'm not surprised might give her the willies too that's probably quite valuable though isn't it yeah surely that sounds cool i like cardboard cutouts yeah. you know those cardboard cutout policemen they have in supermarkets no have you not seen them no what to make you think you're being watched exactly no yeah the constabulary have decided it's a genius mind plan they've got life-size cutouts of constables standing there looking serious and they're putting them in public places constable cutouts yeah to make people just feel that there is a police presence morning constable cut out and i keep thinking i would love to steal one of those really yeah they're not so that people think that it's a real policeman out of the corner of their eye are they are they it's just to instill a feeling that there is a presence but really there, are they mounted on skateboards a, a feeling of authority on the end of a bit of rope no they're not that's <laughs> what, a one idea. of the men behind the delicatessen sh- counter stupid idea. pulls them along no, the bottom pathetic, of the aisles. pathetic corner it's just a path- pathetic stupid response to a Uh-oh. brilliant idea by the met police constable cutouts on patrol <laughs> <laughs> no nicking <laughs> with just a member of the staff behind the Otherwise, cutout saying can you put that back please he might take you to paper court <laughs> <laughs> and give you a foldy fine <laughs> give you a paper cut <laughs> to put you off any more or should we come back to these uh, let's have one more yeah this is from jake i have a daphne and celeste autograph that is absolutely worthless <laughs> i'll tell you right now <laughs> it's pride of place on my pin board i'm 23 my punk band was playing at the same free festival in cambridge as they were when i was about 15 i would say that we you... got them ironically of course yeah 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 sure says jake but doesn't irony wear off after a number of years irony certainly wears off very quickly and it's it's worth yeah. nothing and what's financially. That? that's that's eight years now yeah. irony can't last eight years it means you're a fan of daphne and celeste like david quantic he was always an advocate of theirs really yeah i always remember him championing them uh, but there you go keep those coming in please listeners the text number is six four zero four six the most worthless bit of pop cultural collectible ephemera you've got so ben are we playing the trail and then my free choice is that the way it's going to work yeah we'll do your free choice first then. do my free choice first I, I like that idea better because then then it all gets a bit muddy and confusing it's so then that way it's about you sooner exactly yeah yeah exactly <laughs> that's the and then i'm happy i'm more happy uh this is the electric six and it turned up on my i you know i wasn't a huge massive fan of the electric six album when it came out a couple of years ago a few years ago but actually it's one of those things that's popped up on my mp3 player on random and this track really uh jumped out and i thought wow how could i have missed this the first time around this is synthesizer by the electric six and ben our producer is lining it up right now and i'm filling for him while he does so thumbs up here we go see it faded out in the end didn't it ben you thought it was going to be a big crash bang wallop ending but no that song goes on for about 15 years if you don't fade it out this is adam and joe here on bbc six 
six music and i wish that they would、uh, read the news i wish they could wrap the news in the same kind of style、mm. but some people think that that's not the way to go with the trivializes news. the news too apparently、much. for some people it trivializes it's a shame because kids would like it more but there you go、uh, these are the times we live in it's just gone ten thirty time for the news it's the ethereal folky sound Of fleet foxes with he doesn't know why who was talking there somebody was talking what was that Ben <laughs> who was going someone on someone just very talking、weird. at the end there how dare they but you know I went to see fleet foxes at the Roundhouse in London、uh, last Sunday evening they were playing three nights there something like that yeah and、uh, unfortunately kind of stupidly I mentioned at the end of the show that I was going to be there and I think I may have encouraged some Stephen shouting right for people that don't know about this or have just started listening this is not something that Adam and I have actively encouraged right <laughs> well I suppose we have a little bit. But、um, listeners to this show have taken it upon themselves to do a call and response thing when they're in public. One of them shouts Stephen, the other one shouts Just Coming. It's a way for people to connect with each other who、yeah. listen to the program. We've tried to j- just let this thing grow naturally. Networking, people love yeah, networking. Yeah, yeah. But in- anyway,、um, it happened a lot at the Fleet Foxes gig. Right. Before the show, there was one. As I went in and went up the stairs, there was a very loud one from close behind me. Yeah, and I was just giving the woman my ticket, so I I didn't even look round. No, on that one, there were lots of people there. You are that ultimate Stephen denier. Wait a second, though. I get into the gig, and then there was one very loudly from right beside me. Yeah, and I went and I, I spoke to that guy. <laughs> It was a guy I didn't know. I spoke to him. Oh yeah, you got to let me off the hook for the first one. It was very crowded. You think I should have turned around and and waved? How hard is it just to say "just coming"? That's the、it's、point of the thing. Of course, it's embarrassing. Okay, it's tough luck. But then,、uh, then there was after the first song the Fleet Foxes played, there was a very loud one、mm. from the upper circle, I think, or somewhere quite a long way away from me, and、uh, that got lots of replies from the audience. Yeah. And、um, the Fleet Foxes were kind of baffled. They said the lead singer said.、Uh, You guys talking to each other, like that? Yeah. He felt a bit, I think, left out of the exchange. The, this, is, this is the problem.、Yeah. This is the potential problem with the whole Stephen thing. But anyway, the rest. Of, there was a lot of general, not heckling, but people shouting out random phrases and stuff to、yeah. them. And they're a very laid back band, so they en- enjoyed it, and they were shouting back, and people were. You know, requesting weird songs, shouting out Bob Dylan and stuff, and in the end, he played a Bob Dylan track because people were shouting out Dylan's name so much. Yeah. So they're an affable sort; they don't mind that kind of thing. But we've had various emails from people who were at the gigs on the following nights. Okay.、Um, and here's one from a guy who's actually called Stephen. I think he says, "You've probably already been told this by other people, but I thought I'd chip in just in case. I was at the Fleet Foxes gig on Monday night and heard someone shout Stephen." Before I had a chance to reply, as I feel being named Stephen, I have an extra right to do. The lead singer of the Fleet Foxes got there first. He laughed a lot and said something along the lines of, "I'm onto you. I'm onto your little social interaction thing there." So clearly, someone had done it the night before. Well, I certainly had done it the night before. Well, Cold balls night. Then here's another one from Lucy, who was, I think, at the same concert, and she says, "Just as the applause died down from one of their tracks, what should ring out from the back of the auditorium but a loud explosion of Stephen? As if not shocked enough by this sudden outburst, with lightning quick reactions, a chorus of 'Coming' rebounded back from the stage. Yes, the Fleets, as Robin Pecknold stated." Are on to you. We know there is no actual Stephen. He said this was greeted with much laughter, particularly from myself and my boyfriend, for whom it was our very first public experience of Stephen. Oh well, that's a happy Stephen inc- incident then. So they're on to it, and the reason is that they came into Danny Wallace's show during the week, right? And Danny Wallace and and his、uh, broadcasting、Glover. partner Richard explained it to the Fleet Foxes. Here's a clip of that explanation. Someone shouted in the audience. Someone shouted Stephen, and then on the other side, someone shouted coming. Did, do you remember that at all? Kind of. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Did you know what the hell was going on? No. No. Is that a? Is、I、that a? Stephen was going to meet his buddy. <laughs> there you go. Well, that, that, that <laughs> will explain that. that. Uh, uh, well, well, thanks for it. There. there is a lot of of robust、um, interactions last、yeah. night. I, well, I, I can clear this thing up for you so that you don't have sleepless nights. There's actually、um, a couple of presenters on this show called Adam and Joe, and they have this thing that anyone that listens to them randomly, a person just out. 
in the open can shout Stephen, and if someone else is in on it, they'll just shout coming, and then you know that in the world there's like-minded people. So it was a friendly, happy thing. So yeah, it's like a like um like Twitter. <laughs> uh, very much live yeah. Twitter is live, what like, that was. Yeah, like Living. analog Twitter. <laughs> analog I believe Twitter. they used to call that talking. There you go. Yeah. So the final uh, punchline to this whole story is the Fleet Foxes then set off to play in Paris, and we have a correspondent in Paris, two correspondi, Nick and Caroline, who say, Dear Adam and Joe, international Stevenage here from France, already weak need with excitement about seeing the Fleet Foxes play in Paris, and the prospect of actually letting a Stephen loose into the audience reduced me to jelly. Wait until the first few songs went by. Someone else shouted something. The foxes looked confused. So to put them at ease, I shouted Stephen. Whereupon the lead singer, Robin Pecknold, quick as a flash, said, Just coming. Do you guys have that here too? Wow. International Stevenage. There you go. But do you think he is going to be quite annoyed and fed up by it? Well... It's funny how it seems to have targeted the Fleet Foxes specifically. I mean, yeah. why would... Is it because I said I was going to that concert? I'm sure that... Or do you think it's just a band that listeners to this show enjoy? Yeah, you know, we all love the Fleet Foxes. Everybody they're, uh, loves the Foxes. Uh, they're a very quintessential six-music type band as I well. I did feel a bit responsible on Monday. Because there must be people there as well who find it irritating. Baffling and annoying. Yeah. yeah. And it interferes with their enjoyment of the gig. Because especially Fleet Foxes, you would imagine it's quite a... Uh, a sort of hushed, uh, not to say reverential atmosphere, mm. when people aren't shouting, Stephen! Well, people heckle at gigs anyway. It's something you deal with generally, yeah. isn't it? I suppose. Right? It's sort of accepted. Yeah. Not not heckling, but trying to make contact with the band. Uh-huh. Between tracks. That's all we ask, listeners, that, that you do it between tracks, not during them right yes we're trying to figure out our relationship to the stephen phenomenon but people people would figure that out for themselves you yeah. know we encourage we've always re encouraged responsible stevenage yeah yeah and uh don't you know don't ruin the enjoyment of other people in whatever environment you happen to be yeah right Does i'm feeling else? bad that i didn't reply to the loud stephen yeah, i mean that do you think that's bad i would say that that's the worst thing about the whole story do you think yeah well, you're making me feel very bad and culpable. You are bad and culpable. I was in a swanky club uh, last night, right? And having a, a meeting with some people I wanted to impress. And this guy shouted out, Stephen, as I was walking through. And I gave him a just coming oh, back. Oh, I would have replied. At a swanky no. club, I would have replied. It was very embarrassing. Even he was embarrassed. <laughs> Honestly, because when I came back from the lose, he went, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because his friends looked baffled and looked at him like, you're a bit of a loser. What are you doing at the swanky <laughs> club? So it was an embarrassing thing. But yeah, I gave him back the just coming. I've replied to a couple in the street. A couple. It how many of you ignored this? Two. More than two. I think I'm two, two. Yeah. Two up, two down. Well... Your disgrace is all I can oh. say. So <laughs> sort your Stevenage out. Oh. Here's LaRue with In for the Kill. <laughs> she just sounds out of control, don't you think? She is an 80s ah! revivalist. She's doing a sort of an Annie Lennox. Yeah, but Annie Lennox has got real range, though, and, uh... Oh, poor LaRue. I'm not saying that LaRue's got a bad voice, just... A little bit of myself. I think it's Brills. Uh, they're the London synth duo. They're the talk of the town. They're all the rage. Yeah. Uh, but proving that this 80s thing is out of control and it's sort of uh, completed its comeback, right? Mm, yeah. And to celebrate that, we are doing an 80s song wars next week, supposedly. And we've got some rules for our 80s songs, Well, right? we do so far. We've kind of agreed that we're going to try and do the ultimate 80s song, a song that kind of harnesses every single 80s trope that exists. Oh, right? really? Well, that's what I thought, even though I haven't started yet. How you, would you, you do start that music? It? Yeah, I've started. I've I mean, got I've some gone for something <laughs> fairly generic. Have you? Yeah. What, what have you gone for? Well, I don't want to tell you. Why not? Because it's secret. There's, I mean, the thing is that there are so many pops. You could go for early 80s synth pop, right? Yeah. That's a classic well, 80s. Well, 80s was a, was a long decade. Yeah. It, was, it was 10 years long. It was. But I would say that if you went for something like, I mean, late 80s was the Stone Roses. That would not be... Mm, but a, I, I think you describe it as 90s music, the Stone Roses. Yeah, well, of course, that's what I'm saying, though. The 90s. If you stick strictly to music that was produced yeah, in true. the 80s and ape that style, that's not going to give you because a Because there's everything from jangly guitar pop yeah. to synth pop yeah. to pomp pock. Pomp pock. Pomp pock. <laughs> pomp rock. Yeah, pomp the, big, pop. the big massive drums and synths and things like, yeah. take my breath away. Yes, exactly. That's very 80s. There's, there's sort of, me 80s metal is a very distinctive sound. Right. Isn't there? So that's four different. But you know what the thing is down. that the what the eighties revival if you include pomp pock. I'm, ta I'm talking pomp <laughs> pock. Uh, the, what the what the eighties revival really has honed in on is the honed in on is the 
early 80s synth sound though right yes synth pop well, yeah your rhythmics yazoo the human league yeah synthy stuff Depeche it's the instrumentation they're keen on yeah vince clark era Depeche so that's where Mode. we've got to go do you think i think so i mean then later on you got people like paul hardcastle and stuff mm. like that that mm. still counts doesn't it mm. when was that single 1985 was it something like that yeah oh well lots of different directions to go but i think i've got a good handle on where you're going now no you don't yes i do <laughs> no you don't with my brilliant interrogation technique that's <laughs> made you reveal your strategy <laughs> damn it damn it damn it <laughs> no it might be no. <laughs> 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 i've the, done it i'm the world's worst liar uh, i can't cover anything up it's disgusting listen here's a here's a free play <laughs> this this is a band called hatcham social and they're really good they sound a and this is very reductive when people on the radio say things like that but it, they do sound a bit like orange juice yeah that's what's got me into them he's got a slightly edwin collinsy sort of a voice where did a, you come across them uh, i came across them on another radio station actually Ooh, you listen to yeah, other radio but they stations. have been played by uh, I think Queens of Noise, and also, who does the rock show here? Um, Riley, Mark Riley? John oh, Riley. Some, oh. so, someone like that. They've been played by a couple of DJs on Six Music. They're the latest thing. Oh, Hatcham Social. Hatcham they're Social. named after a social club in Peckham, and they're from New Cross. And this is really good. I've been listening to this song all week. It's from their forthcoming album that's out at the beginning of next month, and it's called something like, if I remember rightly, You Dig the Tunnel and I'll Hide the Soil. You know, with a pen you could have written that down. I wanted to train my brain to remember things. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good... And I'm going to tr try and remember what the single's called now without writing it down. I think it's called So So Happy... Oh, I can't remember. So So Happy Making. So So Happy Making. There you go. This is it. Hatcham Social. That's good stuff, man. Yeah, Hatcham Social. Can't wait for that album. And you know what? It sort of disproves what I was saying about bands having latched onto just the synth pop sound of the early 80s. They're going definitely for that orange juice postcard record sound. I was doing, doing it very the, well. Yeah, and the Wild Beasts, who we played a while back as well, they sound a bit like Orange Juice Stroke, uh, The Associates, that kind of thing. But it's... you still have to be able to write a good song. Yeah. And you still have to be able to sing in an interesting way. Yeah. And play, right? You, you know, I, I mentioned this book before on this show, but uh, there's a book called Rip It Up and Start Again by Simon Reynolds. About postcard oh uh, no not about postcard just about early 80s music in general the whole sort of indie scene and about all the music that we really loved from that time it's such an enjoyable book to read it really is i highly recommend it but um i'm getting a bit emotional <laughs> about the book you know like when you when you do you have this problem is when you try and be sincere suddenly in the in the midst of all the glibness your voice goes a little, on on this program sometimes yeah you kind of go the other way and you start getting a little bit emotional well it's peaks and troughs isn't it it's a very passionate program it, peaks and troughs? yeah fury most it's mostly fury <laughs> quite a lot of bitterness and jealousy and then occasionally some sincerity and sometimes that yeah that can tip the balance <laughs> when you repress so much emotion yeah sometimes it will come leaking it through. leaks through yeah. and then it's very embarrassing it's just, like a stain yeah, just try and repress more <laughs> yeah you need some sort of pad to soak up the sincerity yeah an emotion pad yeah sincerity pads where would they go armpits armpits is that where sincerity leaks out of? yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it, no it comes from the corners of the eyes yeah does it water is leaking from their eyes it's right. what they call tears it's a sign of their weakness <laughs> <laughs> as emperor ming says in the film flash gordon so much that emperor ming can teach you about it. <laughs> there is. About he should do some educational records for kids <laughs> you're quite right listen uh, we'll have some more text the nations very soon what are we going to do now though? we're going to play a trail and after that it's your favorite flaming lip song uh, which reminds you that one day you'll be dead yeah thanks thanks for that thanks for that <laughs> but here's the trail this is the voice of the big british castle it is the top of the hour, ooh, that's wonderful. I got so bored with the last hour, I'm glad it's gone. Now here's the new one, it's exciting and it's new. How do you do? Yes, indeed. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. We're in our last hour near, uh, now here on a Saturday morning. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just looked at Joe and he was smiling. And it set me off a little bit. Because you were looking at your screen there. My screen. Smiling. I was reading some text. There's no telling what you were smiling at. Right, now, come on. Get it together, yeah? Let's have the yeah, jingle well. and get back into Textination. Come on. Okay. Textination. Text, text, text. Textination. What if I don't want to? Textination. It doesn't matter. Text. Do you want to have a go at reading one of these emails, Adam? <sighs> 
Yes. I mean, just to test the dyslexia. Yes. What if I give you quite a long one? Oh, I could do it. And then you'll have to read it quite fast. It'll be fine. Okay, this is quite a long one. You're going to have to speed through. <laughs> but this, is n this is not that fair because you've read it before even. All right, here we go. Text the Nation. Can you just remind people what Text the Nation yeah, is about? Yeah, it's about the most worthless items of pop culture collectible bulls you have collected right this is yeah. from david he is emailing from singapore and he says at the climax of their concerts jethro tull used to launch massive balloons about five feet in diameter with the tull logo on them into the audience much fun would be had as the crowd punched the balloons around the auditorium at their concert at hammersmith odeon in 1989 on the rock island tour one of the balloons hit the ceiling light and burst as the deflated gas bag spiraled to the auditorium floor i knew i had to have it it's a giant jethro tull balloon it didn't land that close <laughs> to me but that didn't make any difference i muscled my way over to where it looked like it was going to land and made full use of my full six feet four inches height Oh my god, he's a giant, this guy, to pluck it out of the air. Success! Of course, success. You're a freak of nature at six. Oi, he's only an inch taller than me. Yeah, I'm joking. I'm just jealous because <laughs> I'm a little man. Uh, the glorious Tull keepsake was mine. For 20 years, I have guarded the burst balloon carefully because it's surely a valuable collectible item. About once a year, I would remove it from my box of mementos and keepsakes and look at it for about 11 seconds, enjoying its beauty. I overlooked the fact that it looks like a whoopee cushion with a hole in it on one side with a Tull logo on the other because this was a rock treasure. Last year, Tull celebrated their 40th anniversary, the perfect time to cash in on interest in the band i put it on, i put it on ebay there, there you go <sighs> dyslexia <laughs> <laughs> i knew it would happen i put it on ebay expecting it to make 30 pounds or more i got no bids I well hate, done i hate it now every time i look at it i feel deflated that's not the email that's me talking to you really yeah no that's from david thank you very much indeed david i think you'll agree i read out your message really rather you well you did a ruddy good job thank well done much. i think you're off the hook you're perfectly normal <laughs> well done thank you here's one from johnny when i was 12 i visited new york with my godmother this is a really good pathetic bit of rock memorabilia i made her take me to cbgb's mm. that's a famous rock bar correct yeah, of course that's where the birth of punk occurred amongst other things i expected to meet some cool bands there however it was the daytime the only people there were some decorators i wanted to get a souvenir to prove that i'd been there and as there was nothing else around i asked the decorator if i could take a roll of toilet paper as there was a big box of them in the middle of the room i took the toilet roll all round america with me and back home to england England. i thought it would be obvious that the toilet roll was from cbgb's and that it would be valuable one day it dawned on me that this wasn't the case when i was in the coach on the way back from heathrow and as time passed i began to resent the toilet roll which came to represent my painful transition from blissful ignorance to hardened cynicism i still have the toilet roll though and for some reason it still somehow seems valuable yeah that's insane isn't it i want that toilet roll you know when we were doing our tv show we did a segment called vinyl justice where we went round to pop stars houses and looked at their records did we? and we did Kanicki one time of course at that point the band was fronted by lauren laverne although she didn't show up on the day to actually do the interview no she wanted the others to get a bit of the spotlight right right um but as we were leaving i swiped a pick a guitar pick you didn't <laughs> yeah because i was just starting. you thought it would be super valuable i don't know yeah and then i, I still got it i still got it because and i know it's the it's the right one because i wrote kinicky on it with a really? uh, silver pen to remind me that it was there. Should pick. give it back to Lauren. Well, I think it was uh, one of the. It belonged to what's her name, Emmy Montrose. Right. I think she was called. So I'm sorry, I stole your pick. That's disgusting. I'll give you two more. But I've had it all this time, and I've never thrown it away. Uh, here's a good one from Vince in London. Mm, this kind of counts. When I was a kid, I went to Disneyland and spent ages collecting all the autographs of the characters in the park in a special book, convinced that the signature of the actual <laughs> Mickey Mouse just had to be worth something. But it's not. It's just a lie. That's true. They must be the most worthless signatures it's possible to yeah, obtain. Yeah, absolutely, from a, an actor playing yeah. the character in a big suit. Oh, the only thing worse than that would be one of those knockoff Mickey Mice on the South Bank. Uh -huh. or in covent garden you know the uh, illegal ones that look like they've just uh come out of some sort of shelter yeah i used to get um people asking me for my autograph when i was a dj at a restaurant did you you know like children and stuff yeah they'll ask anyone for their autograph yeah and i always felt a bit fraudulent i, I used to like 
I started off saying, you don't want my autograph. It's worth absolutely, it's, it's, there's no point. But then all the waitresses said, why don't you just shut up and make them happy? And so that's the thing is you just don't mind, do you? Did it make you a bit happy? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. The first few times you feel important. When the six-year-olds were clamouring, yeah. Here's the very best one I think we've had in so far, though. This is from John in Manchester. I've got a drumstick wrapped in silver foil, uh, which was thrown into the audience by the singer from Babylon Zoo before he was in Babylon Zoo. <laughs> wow. Should have sold it when Spaceman was number one. What was he called? Jazz Man? Yeah. Wow. That is worthless. <laughs> Presumably that he had wrapped in silver foil, yeah. Yeah, because it made it look like it was a space drumstick. It's from space. In the future, people will have drumsticks like this. It's an easy way to make anything look futuristic. It's also very dangerous. I Wrap think. it in tin foil. Because it becomes a, a kind of superconductive lightning rod. Yeah. It's a sexy robot game you can play with your partner tonight. <laughs> Just wrap a bit of yourself in tin foil. And get an electric shock. Uh, is it a sexy game? <laughs> Have you done that? <laughs> <laughs> what is sexy Why would you get that? an electric shock? Well, if you put a current through it. Why would you do that? Yeah, make it more sexy. <laughs> really? I don't know. You're, You're the one who's wrapping yourself up I'm in just tin foil. Encourage wrapping a part of your body in tin foil and pretending it's robotic. You're encouraging listeners to then pass a low current through it <laughs> to make it <laughs> sexy. <laughs> Yes. That's a terrible idea, listeners. You're Don't the one that. wrapping yourself in foil. Yeah, but that's not intrinsically dangerous. You're the one passing electricity saying, through if that you're foil. You're going to wrap yourself in foil. Why, why not, not pop a little current through it? Just like from a nine volt battery <laughs> okay. or something. From I'm not battery. talking about connecting yourself up to the mains. Although. <laughs> no, I'm j- obviously, I'm not talking about that. Obviously. If you're insane and you're listening to this program, please don't go and do that. <laughs> uh, listen, here's the Pet Shop Boys with what's this one called? Love, etc. Is this their new single? Oh, it might be. We're not really sure. Yeah. It must be on the sheet, though, isn't it? On the sheet. They were playing at the Brits. Jackie, did you see them at the They're Brits? not very good at dancing. Well, they just stood there. That's for not their the whole forte, song. though, is it? Uh, it was a. True. I'm being sort of it was ironic. Yeah, this is this is their new single, I think. Right. Well, it's certainly from this year. This is called Love, etc. Here's something that I got when I was extremely young. It isn't gonna kill ya, cause it is only juvenile. We've got another version of that jingle with an actual child singing it, which slightly excuses it a bit more. Do you think? I mean, it's a terrible jingle. Have you got that one there, Ben? You don't want to hear it immediately. That'll drive you insane. We're going to do more juvenile later in the program. I don't want so to hear it. Well, you'll have you'll have to wait, okay? Because we're breaking this up. We have such a, a wealth of stuff mm. to play you from people that have very kindly sent in their juvenile recordings, and this is following on from some clips that Joe and myself played of us pretending to be DJs last yeah, week. Yeah, and we we have to tread carefully in this area because there can be sometimes nothing uh, more sort of self indulgent than playing clips like that. You know what I mean? Yeah childhood clips but some of the stuff we've had through is just so insane and brilliant that we have to play it to you and thank you to everybody who sent through uh, an mp3 file of their stuff we did listen to them all and had a very good chuckle um, but we've had to be slightly ruthless in in paring it down to fit into the show haven't we yes absolutely and and we might i mean if we get more stuff like this we, we should do it as a regular thing so we might play some of the other bits that we got on another show but anyway as far as today's concerned we'll do uh, maybe two or three of these and i'm going to play you some clips right now from someone called naomi and here's the email that she sent dear adam and joe I seem to be emailing you all the time suddenly, but I'm not a crazed weirdo. I just really want to get this nonsense recording to you. Here it is. It's an eight-minute MP3 of my radio show when I was a little idiot, she says. And we've cut it down, obviously. Uh, But it's all good stuff. She carries on. In the show, I seem to have a strong interest in John Major. Not sure why. It must be mentioned, though, that I didn't have a TV growing up, and so my reference to people was limited to mainly the news. Uh, also, in the original recording, I say that John Major and Janet Jackson... Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, no, that's quite good. She mentions in the original recording that they're going to have sex. And then a year later, she's so guilty about saying the word sex in her childhood recordings. Sorry? We don't have that. Bit. Oh, really? Well, it's <laughs> funny anyway. She went and replaced it with the phrase... Record, record token. token. <laughs> they're going to have a record token together. Uh, I thought that was nice, but we don't, we can't illustrate that. Uh, she says, I hope you like the show. Basically, it was a very long clip, so what I've done is I've just cherry-picked a few yeah. bits that give a uh, flavour But this is it. amazing. How old was she when she recorded this? 
Well, she doesn't actually say, and- I think I, it was- was it 11? I think so, it was around that. We, we might talk to her on the phone Yeah, afterwards. we can ask her. But this is- you've got to imagine a very young girl and a little tape recorder pretending to be a radio DJ. So let's have the first clip from, uh, Naomi there, Ben. It is real cool, that song. It's cool- it's by John Major. So it must be brilliant. Everybody around? Yeah! It's real! Right! Right, here is another tune. So, off we go. Oh, my darling bun of man. Oh, my darling bun of man. Macaulay Culkin, Brian Adams. This is a mixture of the both. Oh, why are you over there? Why are you here? I don't know, but why are you over there in the drunken sea? Because I'm over here. Why can't you come over here? Why, oh, why do I have to go over there? I'm too lazy. <laughs> I'm too lazy. Right, why that song was called Justice to the World. I'm so lazy. I'm so lazy. <laughs> Why are you over there? Why Sitting are in you a drunken seat. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Um, amazing. What's that record she's playing at the beginning? That's her, I think. Is it? Yeah. Wow, she's a very uh, creative and talented young girl. Have we got another clip? Yeah, we've got a couple more clips. Uh, here's a clip right now. She does another uh, another short song and references um, Danny Minogue in this I mean, song. she's rapping there, right? She's being the DJ and, the, and then she she became the record. She right. was rapping. She was the artiste. Yes, exactly. And that was a free bit of freestyle rapping. Uh-huh. Incredible. She, she does something a little bit similar here. So now, if we, if you don't mind, I'm going to play a tune with my voice. As I don't have anything else in my substance. And a hairbrush. So here I go. Danny Mino! <laughs> Danny Mino! Sorry about that. That was rather a short burst. But it was actually sung by John Major, so it must be quite a good song. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> She's just got Danny Minogue! <laughs> Danny Minogue! That was John Major with his new single, <laughs> Danny Minogue. <laughs> it must have been quite well, good. I'd want to live in that John world. Major. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an excellent radio show. Here's one final clip right now. <laughs> Before we actually talk to Naomi, because I think we've got her on the phone, uh, here's Naomi with the news. Right, this is some more news on Radio 3 in the morning tonight actually so um now this more news i have for you is about jo um george bush he set off his fire alarm <laughs> to make everybody run to his house so he can have a bit of attention more news in a minute <laughs> and the, the minute has gone very quickly because here i am again um this more news is about paul simon the singer he fought 10 donkeys and he's training them to do donkey rides at a fair. <laughs> that is all I have tonight. How about listening to Michael Jackson blow his nose? <laughs> Gum will be off his nose now. <laughs> it stung him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so she's using all, like, uh, sound effects and everything That's in there. incredible. We better get, get her on the line. Is she there? Naomi, hello. Hello. Wow. We're, like, completely blown away by that. How, how <laughs> old were you? Sorry? How old were you is the first question uh, to I, ask. I, was, I think I was about 11. Wow. And how old are you now? I'm, I'm 29. 29. Well done. Yeah. And what Thank was, you. I mean, what was, the, what was the music you're playing there, that insane synthesizer stuff? The, the first one, it was, uh, I think I had it on demo, and yeah. then I was on this little keyboard, and then I was switching between lots of different instruments and hitting notes. Just doing all I could at once, I think. Wow. And, you, you know, you've got such an amazing repository of surreal juxtapositions and, and crazy <laughs> names there. Where's all that coming from? Who knows? Who knows? What was the um, John Major thing? Had you just found out or you heard, you heard your parents talking about him or something? I don't... I think... Probably. I, I think I just found the name quite funny. Yeah. yeah. And, and I just like <laughs> saying it and the fact that I obviously knew nothing about politics... There's like an abstractness to it. I just said it. You yeah, know? George, it just sort of cracked me up to say his name. George Bush setting his burglar alarm off <laughs> to so get the people attention. would come over because he <laughs> likes the attention. <laughs> what was um, what was going on in your house then? Were you locked in your bed? Well, no. Were you shut in your bedroom on your own there, recording you know what? those? I think I did. 
uh, by choice, shut myself in my bedroom and went, I could do it for, you know, all day. I would just sit there doing it. And in fact, I got known for just leaving the tape recording in rooms and then lit going out. Really? I was just obsessed with my tape recorder, yeah. Now, so what, what's your life turned into now, Naomi? What are you doing? Um, I, I manage comedians. Do you really? Yes. What well, are you doing managing them? Yeah, you should. Have <laughs> that's you never been funnier than <laughs> most of the material that anyone I know comes out with? That's right. That's like early Vic and Bob or something. Yeah, actually, stand-ups aren't very funny, are they? <laughs> but you do, you do radio as well now, isn't that right? Yeah. I, well, I, I had a show on Resonance with my friend James um, right. the other night, and we're hoping to make that regular. Wow. And, you know, it's a mishmash of nonsense and stuff. Similar do, to that. Do you feel you could ever capture that level of innocence and spontaneity without the use of <clears> drugs? <laughs> Again, without the use of what? I was just being glib. But, but do, you, um, do you feel you yeah, still got that... It's uh, funny, actually. When I was talking to the, uh, the, 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 the assistant producer before on the phone, and she was saying, oh, it's funny listening to something and, and re um, not imagining being able to do that, you know, and it's like another world. But it doesn't feel like that. I do sit down with my friend and we just sort of bad lib nonsense sometimes. So yeah. it's still, like, when you listen to it back, you can still hear yourself. Because sometimes when I listen back to, like, last well, week, the, the, thing the with, we Sorry played, to interrupt, but the yeah. thing with girls is the voice doesn't break. I mean, right. there is a tone, yeah. there is a tonal change isn't there the thing that's yeah. so mortifying as a as a man is hearing your mm. unbroken voice and that that really brings the makes sort of years feel, home doesn't right, it? it makes you feel like a different Naomi person. actually speaking to her now it almost sounds like we're talking to the 11 year old Naomi well the nice thing to hear is that the, you, you know the enthusiasm is still there in your yeah! voice life hasn't beaten you down. <laughs> I like the way you do your own audience as well <laughs> do all the cheering Oh. And in fact, a lot of the sound was just like, because you know those tapes with the radio on top, you know, yeah. you just switch between. Yeah, so you yeah, didn't exactly, really yeah. know what you were going to get, which was part of the fun, just sort oh. of saying something and then switching into the radio. It's really and, great, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, I bet, you know what, Naomi, I, I bet you're a really lovely person. Yeah. That's a little yeah. bit of sincerity leaking out of Joe there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> leaking out nice. of my eyes. Um, Naomi... I bet you're lovely too. No, no not, I'm, a, I'm he's a, a sod. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, have you got, like, a website? Do you ever post any of the, your clips up online and stuff? Uh, no, but I do have, um, I have a MySpace with my friend James for our band, You and Me. What's that called? If, it's... It, we love you and me. It's a MySpace. I'd love to hear that stuff. Well, I'll go and check it out. It's a bit sort of mouldy peachy type <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Naomi, thanks so much for sending that stuff in. Absolute uh, pleasure. That's, that's brilliant, and well done to you and to your childhood self. Yeah, thank good, you that's very incredible. Much. Good luck with everything. We'll listen out for you on Resonance. Hope you get Aww, a regular gig there. Thank you. Cheerio. Let's have bye. a little more music. Bye bye. Then we'll come back to I said goodbye as if she was that still was 11. quite a patronising <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye, Naomi. Bye careful bye. on the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some music from Snow Patrol. There you go. That's the sound of the future, kids. Deal with it. That's Passion Pit. Uh, by Sleepyhead. No, other way around, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Grandad. It's just gone 11.30 and it's time for the news. Uh, who's that band then? That was the the Grass, man. Oh, that was the, the Mighty grass. Supergrass with Grace. Wonderful to hear that. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. And now, of course, yesterday there was a huge hoo-ha, not to say a diamond hoo-ha, in the centre of town because you two were playing a gig on the roof of Broadcasting House here. Yeah, we got a, I got a lovely call from a BBC marketing lady inviting me to some drinks last night. She didn't make it clear that they were, they were drinks overlooking the amazing gig. I said no, I had to get an early night because oh. I had the show. And she said, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. I said, yes, I am sure. I, I was going to try and make it, but I couldn't. Apparently there were thousands of people in the street and it was like a big ro rock phenomenon event. Mm. Well, they're the biggest band in the world, aren't mm. they? So we're told. Mm. But this is one of these things where you just kind of feel like, are they really the biggest band in the world? Or is it just one of these monikers that gets ascribed and then people just are happy to go along with Well, it? I was thinking uh, it's important to be balanced here at the BBC. And, it is. and the BBC have had a lot of U2 on this week, right? They've been all across the BBC. So surely it's right that two Six Music DJs <laughs> should maybe spend 10 minutes being really rude about them. <laughs> well, you, you can be rude about them. I'm not going to uh, trash them because I don't want to rule out the possibility that I might one day be friends with them. Right. And that's what, that's the main thing for me is I don't want, you know, I want to hang out with them. Well, one thing Bono was complaining <laughs> about last night in his interview with Lauren Laverne was that uh, apparently white musicians aren't allowed to run huge companies. He was saying it's all right for Jay-Z to run a huge franchise. Oh, right. But, but when, but when white musicians do it who's complaining about white musicians running companies i don't know but this is what bono seems to think he right. seems to think that that you two are less credible because they're interested in their business ventures 
Yes. You know that they're perceived like Richard Branson oh, rather than a, a, like a proper devil may care rocker. Well, it's... But he says that hip hoppers... But isn't that because uh, traditionally and historically uh, African Americans... Uh, have been disenfranchised and not allowed to run companies because of terrible racism. Is, isn't that that argument? Well, um, obviously that's part of it, but but obviously in hip hop as well, they're completely naked. Uh, hip hoppers uh, about the whole their... point of white rock w was that it was a, a reaction against the establishment yeah. and against all of white course. people running companies. And you idiot, Bono. You idiot. For him to complain about some kind of inverse racism seems very disingenuous. Maybe he me. wasn't complaining about inverse oh, racism. He was. Look, I'm trying to slap them off. I balance. know, but I'm trying to stand up for them for balance, right? <laughs> okay. Here's one thing, though. Uh, see how you can balance this one out. When he was playing on Jonathan Ross's show last night, yeah, they played a couple of numbers from the new album, and, and uh, you know, they sounded fine and everything, and Bono started wandering around <laughs> in the audience. But, because he still does all his moves, yeah, even though he's now of a certain age, and he's, he's filling it, he's filling out in that way that, that men do when they yeah. reach a certain point. Morrissey is, and we all are. And then he, he kind of, but he still does all his young man rock moves, like he leans on his amps, he leans forward, he does the, he does the classic Bono moves. And he obviously feels like even in a TV studio, he's got to do something slightly outrageous, and so he sort of wandered off the, the, the riser there and, and and wandered around the tv studio audience who didn't really know what to make of it they're supposed to be trying to touch the hem of his coat a couple they? of people were reaching for but not that many a couple of people were reaching forward and said go and touch me please saint bono and then he went and l just lay down on some people's wow. laps and you could see the character <laughs> they weren't really touching him. they didn't really know what to do they had their hands in the air sort of going should Ew. i what should i do if there's an irish man lying on me <laughs> should i touch him or feel his leather jacket or just leave him alone until he gets up again and that's really what, and and they had a shot of him and he just had kind of had his arms folded he was looking sort of you know just having a little nap i'm a bit tired after all the if jumping he was around. <laughs> if he was less successful yeah. and a wino outside a railway station <laughs> he could pretty much do the same thing couldn't he <laughs> I'm <laughs> singing very loudly and just lying down in strangers laps yeah but people would let him because he has got a good voice still he does you know you're so positive they're the biggest band in the world what's your problem i don't know i just don't think i'll ever make friends with any of them right and so yeah but, but uh i won't now anyway <laughs> <laughs> exactly what if you find yourself in a room with them the edge is going to come over and it's not going to happen he's going to get his bobble hat and try and throttle you with it you know what? He wouldn't because they're too magnanimous. They're too nice. Really? They've seen it all. They've done it all. They're like politicians. They can't afford to alienate yeah, anybody. Yeah, I mean, B Bono must be aware that he has had a huge amount of vitriol directed at him at various points. In fact, I think he even writes a song on his new album about it, no, no. about the perils of, you know, putting yourself out there. So anyway, enough you two on the BBC. Yeah. Uh, if you haven't had enough you two on the BBC, you can go <laughs> to the red button. Though we've been asked to tell you where you can see more you two at the BBC, uh, but that'll be the end of it for our show. Although we are going to play some right now from the uh, gig last night. Which which track good, are we playing? Good. It's uh, it's called Red Button. It's, it's not called Red <laughs> Button. It's called Magnificent. <laughs> this is U2. That was U2 playing on the roof of Broadcasting House yesterday. Can I read it out a text for balance? Yeah. Bill says, can you turn that portentous turgid vomit off, please? Well, you have it's to... It's just balance, man. It's yeah, but balance. where's the where's the positive text saying we that? We played the record. Absolute wickle wackles. Well, the record was doing it in itself be, by being called Magnificent. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought that sounded great. So did I. For balance. Uh, a band absolutely on top of its game. Although, when, again, when they were on Jonathan Ross last night, right? Like a few weeks ago when Morrissey was on, Morrissey handed Jonathan an album by... Uh, I'm not going to be able to remember the guy's name now. A, a bloke that Jonathan is obsessed by, an old 70s actor guy. Uh, did you remember that, Joe? St uh, no. You weren't listening, were you? <laughs> no, I tuned out, <laughs> sorry. Absolutely <laughs> wasn't listening. But anyway, so Morrissey had thought of a, a good present for Jonathan that was actually, uh, you know, perfect right. for him. And had some kind Morrissey. of point to it. Yeah, Morrissey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, I mean... <laughs> I thought we were talking about Bonner. Yeah, because you when know I on tuned, Saturday... When I stopped listening, we were we talking about We do this show, <laughs> and it's on the radio, and it actually goes really? out live. Does it? Yeah. Okay. And so... Yeah. So Morrissey's <laughs> given a present to Jonathan, <laughs> and it's something you can't remember. It was a record by an actor who Jonathan is obsessed by. Right. And anyway, it was a good present. 
<laughs> now this story is going to be no good because of your lack of attention to that what was early the ending part to of it. it could have been a great story the ending is that you two gave jonathan a present and jonathan was like oh this is great this is becoming a tradition giving me a present but it just turned out to be a copy of their album nothing Aww. special about it. it wasn't even signed or anything and that's the end of the story that you didn't even <laughs> listen to the beginning don't, of don't blame it me could have been um, it could have been amazing for your rubbish story could have been sony award-winning genius story and you know because you could have chipped in and go and, and added something to it and provided the name of the actor that i was searching for instead what do i get nothing stonewalling from joe S what's the point cornish what are you even <laughs> reading there i'm reading texts so that we can do synop we can do a really good uh, final text the nation in a couple of minutes all right then. after your free play okay so this is a free play. free play earlier on joe brought in a bit of vinyl he played some orange juice and here is my bit of vinyl that i lovingly transferred and listened to the scratches popples and crackles on therapy growth is this an obscure b-side by thomas dolby it's a good track it's a lovely track though enjoy thomas dolby there with therapy growth and genuine snap crackle and popping there not sort of digitally added snap crackle and no popping. transferred that off my i don't know if you can get that track on cd maybe you can on one of his compilations the orange juice one i played earlier you right. can't get digitally uh -huh. it's quite frustrating there's lots of orange juice you can't get there's only there's there's a compilation called the glasgow school mm. with lots of their tracks on but loads of stuff that's on vinyl you can't get digitally it's bound to be Scandalous. a question of time for the reissue certainly should we wrap so. up text the nation yes thank you to everyone who's texted the subject this week was the most worthless uh, item of pop cultural memorabilia that you've got or supposedly collectible stuff uh here is one from andy in brighton when i was six and on holiday in america i was lucky enough to see a live performance of sesame street oh live uh, sesame lucky. street after it had finished and being a naughtyish little boy i ran onto the stage and managed to find one of big bird's feathers nice I showed it to my mum, who instantly took it off me so I wouldn't lose it. She then kept it from me, as she thought I couldn't be trusted with it. I would often tell my friends about it, but I could never show them as I couldn't <laughs> find it. This went on for about 20 years. What was his mum thinking? <laughs> she can't be trusted with a big bow feather. He'd lose it and get upset. Yeah. She didn't want him to be upset with himself. Right, right. But Mums. then he doesn't get the benefit of actually having the feather. Yes. Well, until he's... it's in the family. Yeah. Last year, I got very angry with my parents. This is 20 <laughs> years later. And accused them of losing it. <laughs> The argument became quite heated, and my dad stormed off and got it for me. Wow. We do have the feather! <laughs> it's now in my hands, and I'm still a huge Sesame Street fan. He refers to it as SS. Yeah. <laughs> Andy in Brighton. That's not a good well way done, to refer Andy. to it, though, is it? Hi, Adam and Joe. In relation to useless pop culture acquisitions, this is from Nick in Sheffield. My girlfriend's brother-in-law was in the audience at the Top of the Pop show that Nirvana played. Wow. Post stage invasion, he got chatting to Dave Grohl and got his drumsticks. Good one. Unfortunately, he didn't get Dave to sign them, and so really they could be anyone's drumsticks. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. I've suggested he get the he gets the sticks DNA tested, like a drumstick paternity test. That would that's like a be rock mad. and roll version of the Jeremy Kyle show. <laughs> yeah. Can mm. they do that? I wonder. Just a little bit. I guess you can. Yeah, of course you can. Bits of if they can catch thieves via what? DNA, they can trace drumsticks. I imagine there's a lot of DNA in drumsticks And imagine as well. what Grohl's done with them. <sighs> oh, they'd be covered I in am. his DNA. Exactly. Uh, and finally, <laughs> from Matthew in <laughs> <laughs> Just carry on reading. <laughs> in <Groucher. laughs> The flood of images. <laughs> says, Dear Adam and Joe, Years ago, in 1989, my friend <laughs> invited me to a Vanilla Ice concert. Not a fan of Vanilla, but wanting to ingratiate myself at my new school, I accepted the invite. During the concert, Vanilla threw his towel into the audience, and <laughs> lo and behold, I caught it, make me an offer. <laughs> that is surely the most debased piece of pop cultural memorabilia we've had today. Is that worse than the tinfoil covered drumstick from the man in yes. Babylon Zoo before he was in Babylon Much Zoo? Much worse, <laughs> because you've got Jazz Man's effort has gone into wrapping the stick there. You think, think the vanilla ice towel? I think that, that takes it. That takes Thank it. Thank you very much indeed for all your texts and emails. And don't forget that you can keep those coming in if you're listening to this show on Listen Again or on the podcast. And your uh, communications might be included in next week's Retro Text the Nation on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, it's a bit complicated, but 
not that complicated nah, if you think nah. about it uh that's it though isn't it yeah we've got time for one more free play yeah thanks for listening everybody and we'll see you at the same time next week this is a track from the new lonely island album do you know lonely island oh yeah they did uh well you can't really say any of their titles no on andy the they're really good they're yeah. on saturday night live and everyone knows who they are but they've released a lot of their songs on an album called Incredible bad this is one that's sung by jack black i've cleaned it up a bit cut a couple of swear words out uh, but this is pretty funny to my ears this is called sax man um, we'll see you next week cheerio bye bye